Okay, so this is going to be a quick video um, on different variants of the optimization procedure for support vector machines. And we're, we're going to try to get around the problem of SVM being relatively slow compared to what we really want out of uh, an algorithm that can handle large data scales. So here's the plan. So we'll ask ourselves if SVM is too slow for the large-scale data problems we're going to be dealing with in the modern era. And then we'll, I'll talk about two fixes for helping to make it faster. Uh, the first is called sequential minimal optimization. And the second will just be stochastic gradient descent, which we've already seen before, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do it for the SVM objective function. So if we think about the optimization that we do for solving for the large margin solution, whether in the primal or the dual, we have to solve a quadratic program. And one of the benefits of using a quadratic program form rather than just the convex programming idea that we used for logistic regression is that the algorithms for optimizing these objectives are much more mature and better understood. So we actually can um, you know, reason about some running times that people have analyzed. So the depending on the algorithm, most uh, quadratic programming algorithms have a cubic worst case time. So if you have n uh, variables or n constraints, or if you have a problem size of n where n is dis determined by the number of variables and the number of constraints, um, then you have to pay, in the worst case, you know, n cubed. Or on the order of n cubed. So this is no good, right? Because for big for big data, we have millions of examples to as a as a small data set and, and billions in the large data set. Um, or you know, I don't know exactly what the scale is nowadays of you know big data in quotes. Um, but it's certainly much larger than we can handle if we have to do um, a cubic time operation. So. Uh, the question is, can we exploit the known form of S the SVM quadratic program to, to try to get around this worst case scenario? And the answer is sort of. It's not, it's, it's not a very definitive answer um, because it's quite diff difficult to get away from these worst case scenarios um, when the data is coming in from you know, a, an uncontrolled environment. But, but in many cases, we can often find good solutions faster than, um, than in the worst case scenario. So let's start looking at the dual SVM. So this is the dual SVM that we worked out the last few videos. Um, and let's just focus on the objective function. So I, I wrote here the whole recipe, so I included the formula for W and B, but uh, in terms of just optimizing or the, the, the learning process, you don't necessarily need W and B. So let's just look at the optimization and we'll, we'll form a, we'll talk about a, a form of optimization for this particular objective function that um, is called sequential minimal optimization. It came out, it was discovered uh, shortly after the SVM was discovered. And it's, uh, we'll write everything in terms of the kernel just to make it more general. And the idea behind sequential minimal optim optimization, or SMO, is to optimize two variables at a time rather than trying to optimize all n variables. So rather than minimizing alpha, the whole vector alpha, we will just minimize, you know, alpha A and alpha B, so two, two of the alphas. And, you know, at a high level, you know, once, once we, you know, that's basically the whole trick. Um, and, you know, the, tr the, the strategy then is being smart about which pairs of variables you optimize at a time. And there's different heuristics for this, you could just randomly choose them, or, or one idea is to find one variable that represents a constraint that's violated and then find some other variable either randomly or also looking for a violated constraint. There's sort of different arguments for what strategies you can take, but you can imagine that they all basically try to, you know, satisfy the idea that you want to eventually optimize all of the alphas um, and you probably want to focus your energy on optimizing alphas that are not already at their optimums. Okay, so the idea is we're going to minimize the the whole objective function over just alpha a and alpha b. And if you stare at the 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 objective function, you can start to isolate the terms that are actually going to be affected by alpha a and alpha b. So first, there's the terms where uh, you know i and j are actually equal to a or b. So we'll have these terms. Um, 
And then there's the terms where either i is equal to a or i is equal to b, and then j is anything else. So here we have the, the these are the the terms where alpha a multi, uh, multiplies by any other index but a, and then the terms where alpha b is multiplied by any other terms but b. So these all come from the big quadratic term, uh, and then we also have these these um, linear terms here, alpha, so we minus alpha a and minus alpha b, and that's it. Right? That's that's all the terms in the objective function that that touch alpha a and alpha b. The rest is just constants. Uh, what, when if we're minimizing just with just with respect to these two variables, okay. So this is almost the whole thing, and then in addition, we also need to enforce the uh, equality constraint that we have that that uh, alpha i times y i the sum of all those is equal to zero. And when we just look at just look at two variables um, where the, all the other alphas are fixed, we essentially have this constraint. We say that uh, y a times alpha a plus y b times alpha b has to be equal has to equal the negative of the rest of those terms, right? So all the alpha i y i's that are not a or b. Okay, and that's one constraint, and the other constraint is just that all the alpha a's and uh, or all the alphas have to be between zero and c. So uh, we just have the constraint that alpha uh, a and alpha b are between zero and c. And if you look at this, you know you you could imagine just right away plugging this right into a, a standard off-the-shelf quadratic programming solver. Um, you know it's two-dimensional, so it's going to be really fast. But you can do it even faster because if you if you stare at these equations, if you do about a page of derivations, um, you can find that there, it's it's there's a closed form solution to this optimization. Meaning that means there's just a formula that you just have to set the alphas to. Uh, you have to do some checking to make sure it's with between zero and c, and then you have to clip it. Um, I won't write the equations here because I'm being a little lazy. Uh, but really, it's it's it's. Uh, it's easier to understand if you just think of it this way. I mean, if you look at this equation, it's a quadratic equation. It's got an equality constraint and, and a bunch of uh, a, a couple inequality constraints. You can uh, imagine how it's possible to analytically find the solution to this, uh, you know, mini two-dimensional optimization. And this was discovered by uh, John Platt in 1998. Okay, so with that, uh, so this is this is the whole idea behind SMO. I haven't given you the full update equations, but I, I, yeah, this is the principle: is that you can solve this mini two-dimensional optimization in closed form. So that makes the update really fast to optimize exactly for two dimensions. Then the idea is you're going to sweep through all different combinations of two dimensions, you know, either randomly or or with some some smart heuristic um, until you eventually converge to the global solution. So now moving on, it's useful also to consider a different form of the primal SVM objective. So we we wrote this, um, you know, the other in the other video that uh, where we're trying to optimize the you know maximize the margins subject to the slackened constraints that everything is classified correctly. Um, but another way of writing this, which is equivalent, completely equivalent, is to get rid of the slack constraints and and just replace them with a a hinge loss. So this is. Um, where we, you know, you, st you still have the margin term, but now you have a a hinge loss, uh, which is just a, a term that's going to be zero uh, if it's negative, and then and then it'll be it, the whatever the input to the function is when it's positive, um, and and the the input to the hinge function is going to be um, the the amount by which you violate the margin constraint. So you know, if one is greater than your uh, score times the label, then you violate the constraint and you get you get some penalty. Now, if it's less than, right, if you if you satisfy the uh, the the margin constraint, then the input to the h function is going to be negative or zero, um, in which case you, you just get zero penalty. And then I also added that you you we're going to divide by n, uh, which essentially just rescales the the uh, regularization function. And I also changed the regularizer a little bit. To to fit the notation uh, standards for this type of objective function, and, and it actually should look a lot like the objective function now that we used in logistic regression, right? So now we have this lambda over two instead of just the the one half uh, you know squared norm of w plus the c times the loss, 
right? instead of having c multiplied by the loss, we now have lambda multiplied by the by the um, uh, regularizer. Okay, and writing it this way, removing those constraints and the slack variables allows us to take uh, gradients asterisk um, takes gradients with respect to the objective function. So here we can just take the gradient of the regularizer, which is lambda w. We've seen that already before. Um, and then the gradient for the, the hinge loss function is just this summation here, where we have you know, y times x, and then an indica indicator function for uh, whether we've got the example wrong. So again, if we got the example right, then there's no gradient because there's no loss. Um, so it's this flat, it's this flat area where you're correct. Um, but then when you get the example wrong, if you don't satisfy satisfy the margin condition, then then it activates the gradient and you, you get just y times x. Now technically this is not a gradient, that's why I mentioned an asterisk. Um, this is actually a subgradient because when things are when your solution um, is at a point where it's right at the the, the cusp between satisfying the margin condition and, and not satisfying it, it's not the, the hinge function is not differentiable. Right? There's no there's no derivative of a of a hinge. Um, but you can you can lower bound the the function with a with e choosing either zero or the, the derivative on the right on the active side of the hinge and either either of those acts as a valid subgradient which can be used in subgradient descent optimization. Okay, so this leads to a way of you doing stochastic SVM, right? So all I've shown you so far is the full gradient, and you know, in order to do this, you have to compute, you have to do n, you essentially O of n work. You have to iterate over each example, check whether you got it right, and then add the gradient if you if you got it wrong. Um, but what you could do again is look at this. We we saw, saw this before. You can look at this, and you can see that this takes the same form as an expectation over the the hinge penalty gradient um, when you have a random uh, uniform distribution over all indices i right so you randomly select a data point and you and you measure its uh, you know whether it got it wrong and then you take its gradient you can do the, the same thing in the objective function or in the in the gradient but in either case you end up with the fact that this is this is equivalent to writing an expectation over a uniform distribution, and that means that instead of you know instead of, of actually computing this expectation, you could just sample from that distribution, and you won't be correct, right? Because you know, sampling from a distribution doesn't get you the expectation, but in expectation you will be moving in the right direction. So the update equation for stochastic SVM is something like this, where uh, you know, here we have all these indicator functions again. So even though it's kind of big on the screen, it's really a really a simple uh, uh, quantity there that you, that you compute just a zero or a one, whether it's um, uh, incorrect or not. Um, and the pieces are, you know, it's just you take W you, and you update it by taking the previous W and adding, or rather subtracting the subgradient. So this is the negative subgradient here. And then I've also added in this formula, a, a step size that has a schedule that, you know, it's a one over t step size schedule that will shrink as we get uh, further into the optimization. And th this can be viewed kind of like a perceptron with a margin and regularization. And in the homework, we talked about how a perceptron um, can be viewed as a gradient uh, or subgradient descent optimization but it has some weird de degeneracies, but adding the margin and adding the uh, regularization uh, corrects for that a little bit, or at least it changes things so that things, so it behaves nicer and has a more principled optimum. And I should mention historically that th this approach you know, was known, but then around in the uh, 2007 or so, uh, Shai Shalev Shorts and folks published a paper Called they, they called it a uh, Pegasus, which stood for something like primal subgradient or something. I forget what the actual acronym stood for, but they they had this this proof that I, you know I'm not putting it on the screen because I know that I'm oversimplifying a bunch of terms in the in the in the proof and the conditions under which the proof is guaranteed. But the basic takeaway message is that the number of steps you have to take to get to a, a good approximation of the true optimum of the of the quadratic program. It actually doesn't depend on the number of examples you have. 
So this is a proof with that that that, that holds true with high probability. So you know, there's lots of uh, you know corner cases and things you have to consider. But the but the rule of thumb, the takeaway from the, and the rule of thumb is that you know with the with the stochastic method for uh, well formed optimization like the SVM one, you you basically can remove the the dependency on the input size on uh, running time, and that statement has many asterisks, and we can look in the paper if we are interested to find out exactly what the preconditions are to make that, that claim true. Okay, so, so let me summarize. Like I said, this is just, just a short video. So the idea behind these two methods, SMO and stochastic SVM, is essentially, like, but they're both motivated by the same idea, which is that you're going to consider only one or two examples at a time, rather than considering the full data set and having to deal with a very large complex optimization, you just solve a simple optimization or to take a simple gradient step based on one example at a time. And people have found that this gives you dramatic speed ups in practice. Now, a lot of times um, there isn't, there shouldn't be an improvement on worst case behavior, but we can see that there's improvements in expected behavior or, or, or just improvements in, practic in practical situations. Um, and then the, I should also mention, uh, we're not going to go into it in this class, but there's another fast SVM training method. It's called uh, the cutting plane um, or active set optimization, where the goal is to, is to sim it's kind of similar in, in the in concept, where instead of looking at all the data um, in your optimization and putting all the constraints in, you, you hope to find only the constraints that are active at the solution, right? So, uh, you know, when you have we know from the study of the dual SVM that um, you know we're going to have a few support vectors active at the solution, and and imagine if we could you know magically just get told that those are the only vectors in our data set. Right? If that were the case, we would still get the same answer, but we would have a lot less data to have to deal with. So this uh, idea of a cutting plane or active set optimization is to is to try to mimic that as much as possible. Now, of course, it's not truly possible, but um, but intuitively, it would make sense that you know maybe all you have to do is find all the hard, uh, all the hard examples that are difficult to classify, and when you do that, then that's all you need to optimize over, and all the easy ones you can essentially ignore. Um, so the idea is that you greedily add constraints to the problem um, until you reach a solution where you can't greedily add any more constraints. But I'm obviously not giving you all the details here, but I just wanted you to be aware of this other approach for faster SVM optimization.